Hey, people, how you doing? What's going on, beloved? We are here this evening, chilling out and talking about our Bible study at New Calvary Baptist Church. We welcome everybody who is on Zoom. We welcome all of the you who are sharing with us um, on Facebook Live. Everybody, Lottie Dottie and all of you who have been riding with us uh, in this Bible study series, it is good to see you and all of the new faces and new folks who might be chiming in. It is good uh, to be here and to share with all of you. And we hope and pray that God has blessed you not only on this day, but in the days ahead. Uh, and that you can look back over your lives and see the blessing uh, of the day indeed. So please know that as we continue in this journey, uh, we have uh, some digital pastors, some uh, digital assistants who are helping. So if you have questions, uh, particularly on Facebook Live, don't be afraid to post them. Uh, somebody will try to get them to me uh, so we can answer some things for you. If you're on Zoom and got some stuff uh, you want to inquire, don't hesitate to do that. This is all about growth and understanding. But we are indeed grateful and glad for this Wednesday as we come together uh, and share with one another uh, as we continue this Living with a Limp Bible study. It is good to be here on Wednesday night. Uh, we are talking about tonight living with the limp of anger. We are going to talk about why are you so angry? We're going to talk about why you're so angry. Are you big mad or are you little mad? We're going to find this thing out tonight as we share with one another. So let's just get to it. Let's um have, enjoy and get a word of prayer in, and then we will begin. Let's pray together. God, we love you. We're grateful for the time that we've come together, grateful for the opportunity in which we can share, help us, stretch us, and that whatever is shared tonight might be food and fuel for our spirits and our hearts and minds that we might grow, that we continue to be transformed, and we believe, God, in your power uh, as we share tonight. God, we pray that something would be done, or something that would be said, something that would be experienced, that would be nothing short of special, that would be nothing short of miraculous, and our hearts might be lifted, and our perspective might be changed. So bless those who are still chiming in. Bless those who are with us tonight. And in all things, we give you glory, honor, and praise. It's in the wonderful name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen and amen. We're grateful. All right. So we got a lot of things uh, that go on in our lives. We got a lot of things that happen with us. Uh, and we consider uh, several different emotions that we face as human beings. And human beings, we face a lot of different emotions. We face a lot of different things. Um, life's journey is full of different experiences and different expressions. I think one of the challenges that we have, particularly as people of faith, um, is we have been convinced, I think, and it's an old, I think it's an old approach, an old philosophy, but some of us still hold on to it nonetheless. Um, it's a philosophy in which we have, uh, believe and we've approached that because we are washed in the blood of the lamb because we are soldiers in the army of God, because we are blessed and highly favored, because we are saved, born again, baptized, fire believers. Uh, because of all of those things, we are impermeable, meaning that we cannot or don't have to let certain things penetrate us. That is a lie of the devil. Let's start that way. Let's just start off. Let me just start off being controversial. That is not what it is. And what happens oftentimes is we get caught up in moments to where we have been conditioned or taught um, or told that somehow or another we are um, impermeable or we are impenetrable when it comes to certain emotions and certain feelings that they don't affect us. And that is just not true. The reality is, is that it is not that things in life don't affect us as believers and as Christians. What the idea is, is that we approach them differently or we're called to approach them differently based upon 
uh, our understanding and our relationship with the Lord. So I want to get this out here right away, that it's not that you weren't experiencing certain things. It's not that you won't experience sadness. It's not that you won't experience anxiety. It's not that you won't be disgusted every now and then. It's not that those things won't happen. What it is and what we come to understand is that despite those things, we have a relationship with God that helps us center those things and understand those things a little bit better uh, and understand understand how we are to manage, how we are to deal with, how we are to enter into certain spaces and certain uh, feelings and, and, and wrap our mind around some of the things that are going on in our hearts. And one of those feelings, one of those feelings that is just as natural as air, one of those feelings that is just as natural as breathing is the feeling and the expression and the emotion of anger. Um, it is understandable. Uh, that all of us get angry from time to time. And I don't care who you are. I don't care how sweet you are. I don't care how loving you are. I don't care how, you know, blessed of the Lord you are. All of us get angry from time to time. So what I am telling you tonight, and you need to hear this, what I am telling you tonight, and this is not a Bible study about not getting angry. Uh, that is unrealistic. <clears throat> You not getting angry is unrealistic, it is unfair, um, and it is unlikely because we all find those particular places. Uh, we will talk about why that is in a minute, but anger, we need to understand, is a factor of our emotional wheelhouse. It's what we experience and what we go through uh, as human beings from time to time. But there are those who live with anger instead of living through the moments that cause us to be angry. I need to say that again. There are many of us who live with anger instead of living through the moments that cause us to be angry. Um, because there is a difference. There are situations in where we can, we find ourselves angry. And then there are situations or circumstances in which we actually live through our disposition and through our lens of anger. And some people live with the emotion of anger so constantly and so consistently that it isn't even emo in an emotion anymore. What happens is it becomes a disposition. And what that means is, is that people live angry. Um, if I was at church right now uh, in a preaching or teaching setting, I would say, does anybody in here know somebody who's living angry? You know what I'm saying? Just raise your hand. Do you know folk who are angry, who live perpetually angry? They seem to be angry in a constant position. And people get angry about different things. People get angry about um, how they process differently. We get angry based upon how we process. People get angry about different circumstances in different ways. But our assignment is not to uh, let anger overtake us. The assignment is not to let anger begin to infiltrate everything that we do. It is The assignment is not to have anger be a part of or be a process of everything we experience um, and every action that we take. When we get to the place where we are angry or we have angry thoughts, um, we, we get to the place where those anger thoughts are in the forefront and the, our ideas and our approaches to life, uh, it causes us to limp. That's when we find ourselves limping. And like we said, a limp uh, affects how we move. And so anger can affect how we move. Anger can affect how we process. Anger can affect how we interact. Anger can affect how we see things. Anger can affect everything that we do. So in this particular study, what we're really doing in this assessment is how we rate um, on the anger scale. We're gonna take a, just a personal inventory. Um, it, it, it's not, it's not a, a pass or fail. So you're just gonna figure out uh, where you relate in terms of your anger scale and what we might able to do to deal with certain situations. And by the way, let me just say this parenthetically, just because you are cool, calm and collected, it does not mean that you aren't angry. Just because you are a calm, cool, and collected individual, it does not mean that you don't live with a level of anger or a, a anger burning in you, right? So we need to do that. There are a whole lot of people who seem very mellow, mild, and 
comfortable, but then all of a sudden they can lose it and they can go to 10 quickly or they do things that are mean spirited. They do things that are ugly. They do things that are passive aggressive. That's where our passive aggressive comes from. Some of my Zoom people are laughing and nodding. They know what I'm talking about, that there are some places just because you are sweet and you come off real mellow, it does not mean that you don't have a sense of anger, a persistent and consistent sense of anger burning within you. So we'll talk about that a little bit. We'll talk about uh, kind of like where you fit uh, self-evaluation or where you fit on the anger scale and how to deal with certain situations of how we're feeling and how to approach different scenarios in our particular lives. Okay. So hopefully this will be helpful. Hopefully you'll get to some places. Hopefully you'll see some things uh, and you'll be able to uh, call yourself to some kind of attention and to how you can deal with those things. Uh, but let's go to the text. Let's go to the scripture. Um, I want us to look beginning at Genesis chapter four. Let's start at Genesis chapter four. I think this is a great text in terms of anger and looking at anger. So you can jot this down, write this down. Genesis chapter four, verses one through eight. And I want you to look at this and evaluate it as we go along or later on. It says, now Abel kept flocks and Cain worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits uh, of the soil as an offering to the Lord. And Abel also brought an offering, fat portions of some of the firstborn of his flock. And the Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering. Uh, uh, and the Lord, but Cain and his offering, uh, did, he did not look upon favor. And so Cain, here it is, was very angry and his face was downcast. And when the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It deserves, it desires to have you and you must rule over it. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, let's go out to the field. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and he killed him. Cain and Abel, good people are brothers. They're brothers, they're family, they're blood. They have the same lineage, got the same parents, but they have different approaches to how they do things. And that's just how siblings operate. They have different approaches because they're different people. And Cain was a farmer and Abel was a shepherd. And their offerings to God were presented and God looked at Abel's offering with favor because simply it was more heartfelt. That's just what it was. Cain, Abel put more thought into the offering. Abel put more thought into the offering that he gave. He gave the best and the first and the best of what he had. And God showed favor upon that. Abel thought and processed and gave process and thought to what he offered. Um, and Cain's offering did not have that same kind of favor. God did not look at Cain's offering with the same kind of favor because Cain did not give the best or the absolute um, best of what he had. He gave what he thought he wanted to give and he gave what was left over. Uh, and so God simply appreciates and recognizes the effort that Abel made. And, and I'm, I'm, this, isn't, this isn't a tithing or an offering Bible study, but we have to take note of that. God recognized and appreciated the effort that was made by Abel. He appreciated the effort because it was the best. It was the best that Abel could do. And God appreciates the best we can do. And God recognizes the best that we can do when we offer ourselves. And this isn't just about tithing in terms of money. This is about how we offer ourselves. God recognizes our best efforts. And verse five says, Cain was very angry and his face was downcast, which means he was noticeably angry, which means he was demonstratively angry, meaning his face demonstrated he was angry. Matter of fact, Cain walked around with his arms folded and his face was pouted. Cain was mad. He was, as we would say in the, in the colloquial, Cain was big mad. He was big mad and he was pouting and God addresses it. God deals with Cain's anger. The question I want to ask is, tonight as we wrestle with this thing is who is Cain angry with? Think about it. Who is Cain angry with? Is Cain angry with himself? Is Cain angry with his brother? Or is Cain angry with God? 
Or is Cain angry with all three? Right? Where's where is Cain anger pointed? Where is Cain's anger pointed? So I want us to start there tonight. I want us to start there. That grabbed me when we looked at this, when I started to look at this text. Where it does Cain's anger evolve from? What is the cause of anger? See, anger is believed to be caused by what's known as the trifecta. Any of you who know anything about horse racing, you know something is about the trifecta. You know that's a that's the one, two, three. That that when you go to the uh, when you go to the uh, racetrack, I, I heard things like this. My granddaddy, he he was a great racetrack fan, and he used to talk about the trifecta. The trifecta is the one, two, three, that the one horse comes in, the two horse, and the three horse. The ones that you pick, they all come in. The perfect race. And the trifecta of scenarios happens when we get angry. We get angry for a group of reasons, and we come, and they come together to bring forth our anger. And Anger comes from these three things, these trifectas. It is believed that it comes from these th three things. It comes from a trigger event, something that triggers us. It comes from the qualities of who we are. And it comes from our own assessment of the situation. I need to say that again. Anger comes from a trigger event. It comes from the qualities of who we are, the qualities of the individual, and our assessment of the situation, how we assess the situation. All right, so let's break that down real quick. The trigger event is the event that provokes the anger, that when you get cut off in traffic, you find yourself getting angry, right? If you get bullied and you don't do anything, and then later on uh, you're mad about it, that's, that's, that's the trigger event. If sometimes if you get embarrassed in public or somebody embarrasses you or says something to you or somebody does something to you, that is the trigger event. So the trigger event is what can initiate a, a feeling of anger. All right. So that's one thing. The next thing is the qualities of who we are, the qualities of the individual, the qualities of the person, the personality traits of who we are. If you're competitive, if you're narcissistic, to be narcissistic means that you to 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 simplify narcissism. That means you think everything revolves around you. You know, those folk, when they when you start talking about a conversation, you say, hey, yeah, I had a problem with, you know, a police officer the other day. Yeah, I had a problem with a police officer the other day. You know, they make everything about them, that kind of narcissistic thing. So if they're narcissistic, some people have a low tolerance for mess. Some folk have a no tolerance for foolishness, right? They got a low tolerance for that. Uh, if you get tired, if, if you are tired, um, you know, we can get angry easily when we're tired. We know how that goes, right? So, and the pre-anger state, what is what is what happens before we even get to that place? So if we're tired, or exhausted, like, like, um, let me give you an example. So if we're tired, we had a lousy day at work, we, you know, we had a boss, we had some fights, we had some issues with some stuff like that. And then somebody says something slick, we'll say, I ain't got time today. Right. That's the pre-existing condition. That's the pre-state of where we were. We were already annoyed. And then somebody tries to mess with us. We like, listen, that ain't for you today. Don't don't come for me because I didn't send for you. You know, that kind of thing to where we we wrap ourselves up in that particular place. Um, because we know if we're tired or if we're exhausted, it we can, you know, those kind of triggers can be even greater. We just like babies, you know how you know how babies get annoyed when they get tired, right? And it ain't just babies. Let's be honest. Some of us, when we get tired, we get grumpy. When you get sleepy, you get grumpy, right? Touch your neighbor and say grumpy, right? That you know that if there's some places that where you get tired, you get evil, right? Because some of us get cranky when we're sleepy, right? So um, that that whole idea is about what we do with our brains and our minds and how we function, right? So what we do in our assessment, the third one is the assessment. So the first one is the trigger. The second one is who we are, right? If we're narcissistic, if we're easily annoyed, if we get tired easy, if we are... Um, you know, competitive, if we don't like to lose, you know, those kinds of things can help us. But the other thing is how we process, how do we process the situation? So is the situ so what we'll do is we'll talk about is the situation worth it? Is the situation really worth me losing it? Is the situation really worth me cussing you out? Is the situation really worth me getting worked up? Right? That's, that's the other thing. So those three things, the, the event itself, right? Who we are, meaning the state that we're in, and ultimately how we process. Am I really going to go off on them today? 
Am I really going to lose it with them today? You know what? Because we like to do this as Christians too. I always get tickled. We do this as Christians. You know, we say, you know, if I wasn't saved, I'd have went after her. <laughs> you know, if I was, if I, if I wasn't saved, if you know, if if it would, you know, if she had caught me on any other day. You know what I mean? We do those kinds of things, right? Because we're processing, right? We do that. We're, we're good for that, right? You know what? I ain't going to say nothing. I ain't going to say nothing. You know, they push me, but I ain't going to say nothing, right? The cognitive, the brain, how we, how we assess, is this punishable? Is this worth me going off? Is this worth me losing my temper? Is this worth me getting angry? Is this worth getting worked up over? Those three things are what create anger situations. These three things determine if and why a person would get angry and would be angry, okay? So to the point there is, must be something that we establish. So we need to understand this tonight. I've said this before, but hopefully you understand it on a different level. Anger is a secondary emotion, okay? Anger is a secondary emotion. We get angry because we feel a certain way, right? We get angry because we're embarrassed. We get angry because we're inconvenienced. We get angry because we do feel shame. We get angry because we are sad. We get angry because we are disappointed. Anger is the emotion that demonstrates itself based upon something else or how we feel. So there is a feeling behind the feeling of anger all the time, right? That's why when you go to counseling, and that's why when you go to therapy and you go in and somebody notes that you're angry, the therapist or somebody or even your pastor might say, I'm noticing some anger. What's that about? Right. Because the anger is behind. There's something behind it that you need to get to the root of so that we can correct or that we can adjust. That is why we ask the question. That's why I asked the question tonight. Who is Cain angry with? Who is Cain angry with? Because whoever he's angry with is producing or helping to produce the anger that he's feeling because he feels something in order to be angry. Right. And that's an exploration in and of itself. Right. And if we, we can only ask Cain, what caused you to be angry? What, what brought about that sense of anger with you on that particular day? Right. James. In uh, James' um, a letter, uh, chapter four, verses one through two, it says, what causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and you do not have, so you murder, you covet, and you cannot obtain. So you fight and you quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. And I think what James is up to, and I think James is on to something, is that anger is always about, on some level, what we would rather have happen. Anger is about what we would rather do. James uses the word desire, but I think it's about what we would like to have happen instead of what did happen, right? If we look at anger in that way, then we could possibly alleviate a lot of the moments of frustration by simply talking about what we would have preferred in certain situations. So when event, so when something happens and it causes us to be angry, we might be able to catch ourselves and say, you know what, this is, this is upsetting. I would have preferred that you had done this. This is upsetting. I would have preferred that this happened, right? Because it's about what James calls the desire. It's really about the preference and what we've in some way, <clears throat> shape or form, been let down with and what's caused us, what's brought the anger out in us, right? If Cain would have asked God why his offering was rejected, God, why, why did you not, why did you reject my offering or not show favor upon my offering? Or if Cain said, well, what can I do, God, to make my offering better or accept it like Abel's, then maybe he would have understand, uh, understood greater what he needed to do and what needed to happen, right? As opposed to just living and sitting in anger and being angry. If he had just said, you know what, how can this be better? God, what is it that you could do to to, to show favor upon this, right? Oh, but if it were just that simple, if it were just that easy to have a conversation, <laughs> but how many of you know that when you are angry, it is difficult to process? When you are angry, it is difficult to process. There is such a deep-seated feeling that can result actually in e internal affirmation that causes us to act out. 
Physiologically, I'm going to help y'all out physiologically. And we're going to talk a little bit about biology tonight. Physiologically, there is something that happens to your brain when you get angry. Your brain actually gets warmer. Your brain actually gets warmer when you get the more upset you get. And here's the thing, the hotter your brain gets, the more difficult it is to process information. That's why when you get angry and you get mad, you can't hear what people are saying. That's why when you get angry and upset, you can't, even when somebody's trying to reason with you, sometimes you can't even hear it because you're on that other level. That's where the term, are y'all ready? That's where the term hothead comes from. That when your brain begins to increase in heat, it does not process as well, right? And the reason why it increases in heat is because the neurons and the electrons and the electricity that's going on in your brain continues to get faster and faster and faster and faster because faster you process it, you're starting to think, and you're starting to get worked up. And so you can't process like you would if you were calmer. That's why, and it makes everybody mad who's angry. That's why when you get angry, somebody says, calm down, chill. And that just makes you more angry, right? It, it would be nice if we followed that, but that just makes you more angry, right? Absolutely. Brown Brown, keep a cool head. That's what it is, right? So look at, look at Genesis chapter four, go back to four. Let's look at verses six through eight, okay? So the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. Now, then Cain said to his brother Abel, let's go out into the field. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and he killed him. God lays it out. God cuts through the confusion. God gives Cain advice. He says, what are you angry about? If your offering was ge as genuine as Abel's, you wouldn't be in this situation. If your offering was, it was as genuine and as thought out as your brothers, you would not be angry, right? So if you do right, then you won't have to be angry about it. God tells Cain to check his feelings and self-examine. And most of all, he tells Cain that his, if his emotions continue, and this is the important part, God tells Cain, if you continue to let your emotions get the best of you and your emotions go unchecked, sin is going to grab hold of you. Sin is going to grab hold of you and take you over. If you do not check your emotions in regard to your anger, sin is going to take you over and it's going to have control over you and you need to take control of your feelings. But with all of that, with all of that, Cain is still caught up in the anger of it all. And through it all, he kills his brother Abel. And he just doesn't kill him. He plots to kill him. He strategically goes after him. He says to him, come, let's go into the field. That's deliberate. That's intentional. That ain't no accident. That's not I'm mad at you and I attack you. That's I'm planning to do something to you. Come, let's go into the field. Now, where I'm from, that's called premeditated murder. Where I'm from, that's calculated, which means anger was on Cain's mind so much that he lived with it enough to have it control his action. Hear me what I'm about to tell you. Hear me what I'm about to tell you. Anger is more than just an emotion, okay? Anger is energy. Did y'all hear what I just said? Anger is more than just an emotion. Anger is energy. And all energy, all energy has to go somewhere. All energy has to go somewhere. And if you don't control the energy you have when you're angry, you can misdirect your anger in the wrong places and to the wrong people. How many of you all went after somebody Right? How many of you all went after somebody because you were angry and it wasn't even them you was angry with? All energy has to go somewhere. Ang emo anger is not just an emotion, it's energy. The, and, and this is this is, I know we haven't talked about it much, but in this month is domestic violence awareness month. And 
There are abused persons all over the world, all over the nation, and, and much of what victims of domestic violence are experiencing is the anger of, or anger exercised in the wrong ways to the wrong people that victims of domestic violence are really victims of people who have misdirected their anger because a lot of times it ain't got nothing to do with them. Men who are angry at their situation in life, they're angry at their station, they're angry at something that happened, they're angry at their job, a dream that is deferred and they take it out on the spouse. A wife that's angry at what has happened to her in the past, a wife that's angry because of the things that a husband is doing, and they take it out on their husband or they take it out on their children. Anger and frustration are destructive because they create collateral damage. They do damage not just to us, they do damage to what's around us. How many of y'all know people that just tear up? They just tear up. You know people that just know how to tear up. They come in a room and they are completely destructive. It is not about productivity. It's not about development. It is not about forward movement. I just want everybody to know how angry I am. I want everybody to know how I'm feeling and I'm willing to tear everything down in this room for everybody to get it. Because there are always those around us who are swept up in the crossfire. And I'm not making an excuse for domestic abusers. I'm not making an excuse for anybody. What I'm saying is we need to understand where this anger comes from. And just like Cain, the anger is misdirected. Abel didn't do anything to deserve what Cain did to him. Abel didn't do anything to deserve that. And no matter what a spouse or a parent says to you, and I'm trying to help somebody and be a blessing to somebody tonight, no matter what a spouse says to you, see what you made me do, you did this, no matter what a spouse says to you, no matter what a parent tells you, well, you know, I did that because you, I did that because you, you do not deserve the mistreatment you get from somebody else's anger and misguided energy. You do not deserve that. That is not what you deserve. People who cannot manage or deal with their anger, you do not deserve to be the recipient of the recipient of the, of, of what other people are not able to manage. And you need to know that. Psalm 37, Psalm 37 verses eight and nine says, refrain from anger and forsake wrath. Fret your, not yourself, it tends only to evil. For the evildoer shall be cut off, but those who wait for the Lord shall inherit the land. Anger can cloud our judgment. It can cause the wrong reaction and anger can make our steps for the future very, very, excuse me, very, very difficult. It can make the steps for the future and the steps that we do in the future very, very difficult. That, that there are those of us who, because we have been angry, we have done things, we have said stuff that we cannot take back, that we cannot correct, we cannot fix. We can apologize for it, but it does not mean we can get those moments back. And it becomes difficult to repair what happens when we're angry. Because it is believed that there are some habits and some attitudes that can be linked to people who are prone to anger. There's some stuff that, you know, uh, people who are prone to anger, it is believed that, um, you know, that they've got some kind of traits and some of those traits we're going to talk about tonight. So real quick, some of the traits are entitlement, right? Entitlement is simply believing that somebody's rights and privileges are superior to other people's rights and privileges. So if you have a sense of entitlement, you believe that what you want and what you think is more important than what other people want and what other people think. Entitlement is the thing that says, yo, listen, I'm supposed, this is supposed to happen this way. And if it doesn't happen this way, then it's somebody else's fault. Okay, stop right there. Stop right there. Is this not, New Calvary, y'all know how we do it. Is this not the issue of some of our European brothers and sisters? Is this not? When we talk about the Kins and the Karens of the world who call the police on bird watchers, who call the police on black folk because they having cookouts or selling water. People who have hijacked the a political party because they feel like the country is being lost. And so they condemn criticism or critique. They condemn injustice, but celebrate the advancement of their own conditions. 
and they can even play victim. They even play victim. So when I call the police, but then you put a camera on me, I start to cry. Or when I call the police because you watch birds and I say, I'm going to say a black man is threatening me in the park. And then you lose your job. All of a sudden you the victim. Right. That there are certain things that happen as a result of entitlement, certain things that you have convinced yourself you're supposed to believe to have and other people are not supposed to have them. What happened in Charlottesville when they walked around and said Jews shall not replace us. And they walked around trying to petition for monuments and they and they circled a church like it was Birmingham in the 1950s. Killers of Ahmad Arbery and uh, uh, who, who, who hunted him down in the street. Who, who hunted him down because they, he was, they didn't think he deserved to be in the neighborhood. Same thing with George Zimmerman, right? Hunted them down in the street because he didn't think he deserved to be in that neighborhood. Dylan Roof, who felt he had the right and the privilege to enter a church because he thought he was starting a race war so he could kill some people who were in Bible study. Did not a fake president make a campaign and run saying, make America great again? Well, what does that mean? It means that there's certain people who are entitled to something that other people are not. Entitlement means you believe that you should have more than others. And when others advance, when others grow, when others stretch, it makes you angry. Angry so much that you would change history. Angry so much that you would fight to have the truth be told. So when they talk about, we gotta teach critical race theory, which ain't nothing but American history, real American history. You fight it and you resist it. You say, that's not what needs to be taught. Don't teach the truth because it will take away our entitlement. Proverbs chapter 18, verse two. A fool takes no pleasure in understanding, but only in expressing his opinion. Oh, that's a great proverb. A fool takes no pleasure in understanding, but only in expressing his opinion. If you cannot reason and you think that the only thing that needs to be heard is your perspective, then you will quickly find yourself in places of anger. So entitlement is a thing of, that, that can, entitlement is something that can bring forth anger. Another thing is focusing on things out of personal control. And what that means is other people's behavior you cannot control. Like you, you, you work hard to control other people's behavior what other people are doing. And because you can't, you can never control what people can do. It drives you crazy. It makes you angry. In fact, as we're talking about domestic violence, that's really what the issue is. The domestic, the domestic violence issue is really about control. It's really about moving people to a place of control. And so if I can't control you, then I get angry. If you don't do what I want you to do, then I get angry. Okay, focus it on things out of a person's control. The other thing, that's number two. Number three is external regulation of emotions. So what that means is you're just trying to regulate emotions by controlling your environment. Right? So if I'm not around them, I won't get angry. If I'm not dealing with them, they ain't going to get on my nerves. Right. So that's why a lot of times at the family reunion, certain family members don't come because they're trying to externally control their emotions. I ain't going because I, I'm telling you, if I see Tony, I'm going to jump on it. Tony, it, 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 in 10 minutes, Tony going to say something slick and me and Tony going to get into it. So I'm just not coming to I'm just not coming to the cookout. I'm not coming to the reunion. Right. As if, you know, those things, as if you can monitor those things for your entire life. You cannot cut off, you cannot cancel, right? Everything in your life. There's some things you're gonna have to deal with. That's why we're these millennials, millennials are real big into cancel culture, They're into blocking you, right? You, you know, you say something on my page, I'm getting you getting blocked. <laughs> right? You say something on my Instagram, you're getting blocked, you're getting canceled. This cancel culture, we don't like what you're saying, we're gonna cancel it. 
right? David Banner. Y'all, some of y'all are old enough to remember. Um, one of my one of my favorite things to do, I think it was Friday night. One of my favorite things to do on Friday night was watch the Hulk. Remember Bill Bixby, the incredible Hulk? He played David Banner and he used just to walk from town to town. He would walk from town to town and he wouldn't stay anywhere. Why? Because he didn't stay anywhere because if he got angry, it would expose the Hulk, right? It would bring the Hulk out in it. Right. If he got angry, he, Mr. McGee, don't make me angry. You wouldn't like me when I'm angry. Right. It would bring out the Hulk in it. Right. And so he couldn't stay anywhere. He thought that if he controlled his external surroundings, it would prevent him from being angry. But what happened every week with David Banner? Every week, somebody would make him mad and every week the Hulk would come out. All right. So external regulation of emotions. All right, the next one, external locus of control. And when I say locus, meaning you believe your well-being is controlled by stuff on the outside. Your external focus on control. So other stuff makes you happy. And if, 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 by, if by that point, other folk make you happy, then other things can make you mad, right? So what we say is, you made me mad. Or my mother made me mad. My mom made me mad. My boyfriend made me mad. Climate change makes me mad, right? Here's the news. Can I give y'all a news flash? You are choosing anger to deal with how you feel. Nobody has made you anything. You have chosen to be angry. You have chosen to use anger as a tool to deal with how you feel. Cain wanted to believe that it was Abel's fault. He might even wanted to believe it was God's fault, but he couldn't reach God. He couldn't get to God, but he could get to Abel. But he wanted to blame God and he wanted to blame Abel for Abel's gift. Nothing that Cain did was about his own well-being and his own actions. Nothing about it had anything to do with what Cain was responsible for. The abuser always blames the victim. If you would just do this, everything would be fine. If you would just do this, everything will be okay. If you would just do this, then we would be good. But how many of you know, dealing with those kinds of people, you could do everything they want you to do and they would still be unhappy and they would still be angry. How many of y'all have been in situations with friends? You've been in relationships. You've been in certain dynamics where folk talk about all of the stuff that you ain't doing. They talk about you ain't doing and you ain't doing and you ain't doing and you do all of those things or make those adjustments and they're still unhappy. They're still angry because the truth of the matter is the external does not determine the angry. The angry is chosen and that's a choice and we have to understand it. And sometimes it happens, but we have to understand that anger is what we are dealing, how we are dealing with things. All right, next one real quick. Refusal to see other people's perspectives the refusal to see other people's perspectives. If if you can't see, if you don't agree with it or see it just the way I see it, we are enemies. And isn't it tragic in this day and age that is just how we are looking at the world. The pinnacle of how we saw the world came from the fake president we just had because that's how he dealt with everything. If If you aren't with me, you are an enemy of me. And if you have a different opinion of me, then you are an enemy of mine. And so he can call you names. He can attack you. He can a, a deal with your infirmities. He can talk about uh, minorities. He can talk about people with disabilities. He can talk about all of that because the whole idea was if you don't see it like I see it, you are an enemy. And the tragedy of it is, is that as a country and as a nation, we have embraced that philosophy. Social media has exacerbated it because it's all made us social media tough people. We are social media tough guys. Everybody can say whatever they want on social media. We'll never say to nobody's face. Right. And so um, the so we so we cancel, we block, we shame because other people have different opinions. When other perspectives are included, they are seen as threats. They become the other. And they are tried, judged, and convicted for being outside of what is considered the right of what somebody says. So refusal to see other people's perspectives can make people angry or or creates angry spirits. 
Low tolerance for discomfort. That's another one. We hate to be uncomfortable. This is another control issue. Low tolerance for discomfort. So um, people who get angry easily if they're teased, right? Folk who get teased and then they get real mad. They say, yo, man, we just joking. We just hanging out. We just chill. Relax, relax, right? Folks who have low tolerance for discomfort because teasing makes them feel uncomfortable. Their insecurities, you know, are bothered and stirred up. Low tolerance for being ambiguous. Ambiguity, that's the next one. Low tolerance for ambiguity. What does that mean? When there is no definitive, when there's no definitive, they lose it. People get angry when you say, well, I don't know. Or I'm not sure. Okay, so where are we going? I don't know. Okay, well, what you want to do? I don't really know. All right, well, what you want to eat? I ain't really sure. And then they lose it, right? That That's ambiguity when you're ambiguous. Oh, it really don't matter. Oh, I really don't care, right? People get worked up. People can get worked up and lose it, right? It leaves too much room for the unsure. It leaves too much room for unsure. It leaves too much room for chances. It leaves too much room for open space, right? And the last one is, no, no the second to last one is, um, if you're hyper about blame, you're real big on blame. There has to be a blame thrower in your world. It has to be somebody's fault. Somebody has to be blamed for it. When it's somebody's fault, it makes us feel better because it ain't my fault. So it could be somebody else's fault. We've talked about that before. If a person passes away, if a young person dies, right, we want to say, well, what happened? Oh, well, they was out, you know, it was three o'clock in the morning, they was out. Oh, well, you know, 13 year old need to be out that late, right? We, we, we process, it makes us feel better. It's gotta be some kind of fault, right? If, if somebody passes away, well, what went on? Well, what, what happened? Oh my God. Well, they smoked four packs a day. Oh, okay, all right, well, yeah, well, look, you know, that'll do it, right? Because it, it's got to be some blame, makes us feel better. But when nothing, somebody who's healthy, somebody, just goes to glory and we ain't got no explanation, it causes us to be uneasy because we can't put blame on somewhere, right? How do we not do that, right? Um, we, we, put, we put blame on certain things. We put blame in certain places. Someone has to be the villain. It makes us feel better when we point fingers. It makes us feel better, right? And last but not least, the fragile ego. Can't take criticism, can't take evaluation. The mirror bothers them. The mirror bothers them. You put the mirror up in front of them, you're gonna smack it down. They can't take a look at themselves because it exposes the blemishes. I see you, Blackwell. We about to get to your question in a minute. Romans chapter 12, verse 21 says, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Which in this context means don't get wrapped up in the things that can cause anger to fester and develop, but overcome the anger with positive things. Come, come across... Um, and come overcome anger with, with things that are positive and positive energies, right? Because we talked about energies. This is about, this is about understanding how we manage certain energies. Anger bi biologically can cause so much adrenaline in our bodies that uh, too much adrenaline entering our bloodstream, if it is consistent, it can increase our heart rate and our blood flow, which will affect our cardiovascular system. So living with the limp of anger can literally cause your immune system to deplete and it can literally shorten your lifespan. So the whole idea about, oh, just let it out, just let it out, just let it out. No, you, you angry all the time, that messes around with your health. That messes around with your health. That messes around with your well-being. Messes around wondering why you got a heart attack having a heart attack. It's because you run around here angry. It ain't always, it ain't always hog mogs and chillings. It ain't always pork, right? Some, some of it is our anger. Some of it is our lashing out. Not to mention a life of distance. A life of distance. Being angry creates distance in our relationships. But in reality, for some, some of us, that's kind of like what we want, right? Some of us are angry intentionally. Some of us are cold and short intentionally because we don't want close people close to us. Because if people get close to us, that means we have to be vulnerable. And if we're vulnerable, that means we have to share. And if we're vulnerable and we have to share, that means we can run the risk of being hurt. And if we run the risk of being hurt, that means we can be disappointed. And so what we would prefer is just sometimes is to be standoffish. We'll be rude, we'll be angry, we'll be mean because it keeps people at distance. But even distance affects 
our health and our well-being, right? Because if we are in relationship and if we are connected, that means we have to, oh my God. If we're in relationship, that means we might have to, every now and then, we might have to adjust. Did I say it? We might have to adjust. We might have to be flexible in some stuff. Oh my goodness. We might have to be actually flexible. We might actually have to cooperate with people if we walk around actually sharing with other individuals. Mm -mm, I ain't for that. So before you get worried, before you get worried, Jennifer Blackwell already dropped it on us. There are different kinds of anger. There are different kinds of anger. Anger is the core emotion. Understand this. We're going, I'm going to try to go through this quickly. Anger is a core emotion, but it can manifest itself differently. We can all be angry, but how we manifest it is different justifiable and righteous anger is moral outrage, right? So the injustices of the world, right? Human rights issues, abuse, oppression, uh, it can all move people to change when you're angry righteously, when you have a righteous anger, when you say, look, this ain't right. You know, when you see, when you see an injustice and you say, this isn't right, it causes you to speak out, stop that or cut that out or don't do that, right? That it can cause change in the short term. So justifiable anger, when you see a wrong, those kinds of things, right? They can create uh, change. They can move things to change. Matthew chapter 21, verses 12 and 13 says, and Jesus entered the temple and drove out all of those who sold and bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. And he said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. Jesus's justifiable anger um, is that he goes into the temple. We've talked about this before. Jesus goes into the temple and he sees people selling and doing money exchanges and selling animals for sacrifice, which isn't a problem. That is not the offense. The offense is, is that they are overcharging and exploiting the people from other parts of the world. The people who are coming for the Passover, the people who are coming for the feast, they have to do the exchange of money and they have to find animals to sacrifice. And the people are exploiting that to the point where they are abusing the privilege. And Jesus understands that and sees that and turns everything over. That's justifiable. The righteousness of the moment says, this is wrong what you're doing. Okay. Ephesians chapter four, chapter four, verse 26, book of Ephesians says, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger, right? If when you talk about not sinning when you're angry, it, what it means is do not create an offense. Don't operate in the place of offense. You know, so that's, that's relatable, you know, what that is. Sometimes, you know, you just got to let people know that is wrong. And they may be offended, but it doesn't mean it ain't wrong. So um, you have to understand that. So how do you work through this anger? How do you work through this anger? This is what a lot of people were asking tonight. How do you work through this anger? Being angry can be managed. It is manageable. But like all things in dealing with emotions, it needs to first be recognized and then it needs to be worked on. Like anybody who has lost weight, like anybody who's in training, like anybody who is learning a new skill, anybody who's got a new job, you have to learn it. You have to be trained in it. It just doesn't fall out of the sky. You just don't go to the altar one day and say, God, release me of this anger. That's not how that's going to go. That's not how it's going to go. It, it, I mean, it can do. God can do all things. But more than likely, you're going to have to train yourself and grow in places to where you manage your anger. All right. So here we go. We're going to go through this and we're going to let y'all out of here. So how do we manage these anger emotions? All right. So here's what the experts are saying. Sleep. Get you some rest. Sleep deprivation makes it harder to control angry impulses. If you are tired, if you are fatigued, if you are annoyed, it makes it harder for you to control your anger impulses. Healthy sleep can prevent you from being provoked. Because we already know if you're evil, if you're tired, if you're worked up, something can happen and you can get set off. It just, it, it don't take much. Particularly when you're sleepy, it don't take much. And I'm looking at some of y'all faces and some of y'all are guilty. All right. So consider number two, consider alternative interpretations. Ask yourself what evidence do you have to support your anger interpretation? Right? Am I, is this really, am I really, am I, why am I angry at this for real? Why am I really angry at this? Am, am I, am I, am I making too much out of this? Why, why, why am I, why am I about to blow up? Why am I about to lose it behind this? 
right? Consider different perceptions, consider different ways to do that, all right? Because how do, how, do, how do I enter this thing differently, all right? Number three, take deep breaths, get a woosah, all right? Bad Boys, the movie, your pressure points, get you some woosahs, take long, deep breaths using the diaphragm rather than your chest. Deep, in through your nose, out through your mouth. Breathe, breathe, breathe. When somebody, that's what somebody says. That's what somebody says. When somebody says, and y'all get mad, somebody says, calm down, chill out. That's what they're really saying. Breathe, take a minute, take a breath. Let me mellow this thing out. Because what happens is you slow down your heart rate. When you slow down your heart rate, you slow down your brain. So take some time, take a breath. Right. That's why it's better to sometimes talk about things later than it is in the particular moment. Sometimes. OK, avoid the catharsis myth. What is the catharsis myth? Venting, yelling, screaming, acting aggressively. Just let it out. You'll feel better. That's a myth. Right. It does not tend to reduce your anger. All it does is it works you up. If you continue to yell, all you're going to do is keep yelling. That's all that's going to happen, right? Aggressive content does not tend to release anger efficiently and effectively. Number five, know that it's okay to get mad. It's okay to get angry if you have been wronged, if you've been treated unfairly, if you've been provoked, if you've experienced an injustice. You should get angry, but express it assertively rather than aggressively. Did y'all hear what I said? Express it assertively rather than aggressively. So now we're going to get to that. What does that mean, Pastor? To assert, it, to, uh, to assert it, to address it and express it assertively as opposed to aggressively. So how do I deal with anger when I've been, when I'm right? How do I deal with anger when I'm right or wrong? <laughs> how do I deal with anger when I'm right or wrong? Leviticus chapter 19, verse 17 through 18. Leviticus 19, 17 through 18, you shall not hate your brother in your heart, but you shall reason frankly with your neighbor, lest you incur sin because of him. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself, for I am the Lord. How do you address those moments? How would you like to be addressed in those moments? That's how, that, that's how you approach that. How, how do you address your anger? How would you like to be addressed with somebody who is angry with you? So number one, number one, how do you address it? Number one, assertively. Distance yourself from the angering situation. It's going to help you to stop mulling it over in your head and you're going to get a clear path forward. Number two. This first, first, distance yourself from the angering situation. Number two, dedicate time to thinking about how to solve it. How do I go about this? How do I talk to them about this? How do I say about this? And get to the root of the problem so it doesn't occur again. See, what we do is we say, you know what? They say such and such and such and such. Next time I see them, watch what I do. Next time I see them, watch what I do. Right. Next time I see him, watch, I'm going to tell him all about it. And what we do is we make it a beeline to get to him without processing how we can better effectively do that. Right. It, it, y'all can't act like y'all don't do that. I've seen you in church. I've seen you make a beeline to somebody just because you've been itching to cuss them out all week long because of the meeting that you had. Right. Dedicate time to thinking about it. Number three, express your anger assertively with solution oriented approaches rather than aggressively. Express your anger assertively rather than um, aggressively. So find solution-oriented, solution-focused approaches. So what's the difference? What's the difference between assertive and aggressive? Because they're, they're, because they're tricky, all right? I'm gonna do this and I'm gonna let y'all go. What's the difference between assertive and aggressive? Assertiveness is a helpful way of communicating what is clear, direct, and constructive. Now, when I'm being assertive, I am talking about what needs to be clear, what needs to be direct, and what can ultimately build and create. Assertiveness is built on understanding that your own needs as well as somebody else's needs are both important to consider and that both deserve to be respected. 
This is important because when we're angry, we often connect disrespect to our anger. And so when we feel disrespected, we want to go back in disrespect. But we have to understand that other people's feelings are just as important as ours. And, but we can be clear and direct and look to build instead of tear down. Aggressiveness, that's what it is to be assertive. Aggressiveness is the way of communicating when you try to control the behavior of other people. You put your own needs first without consideration for anybody else's needs. Some people shy away from being assertive out of fear of being aggressive, right? They say, well, I don't know, it's such a fine line, right? This is because assertiveness can sometimes feel aggressive when it's a new behavior or it's unfamiliar. But assertiveness and aggressiveness are not the same. Assertive communication shows respect for other people's needs. Aggressive communication does not. It is respectful, it is clear, it is firm, right? This includes listening to another person and showing interest or concern. You know what? I understand that th this is your perspective, but this is how I feel about this, and this is how I'm going to feel about this, and then you need to know this is where I am and this is where I stand. Right now, we can agree to disagree, but this is how I feel about this, and you need to know that. That's assertive. Aggressive is, I don't care what you think. I don't care what you say. It don't matter to me. It don't matter. It don't matter. It don't matter. Right? That's, 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 ag that's aggressive. Right? right? But assertive is like, listen, listen, this is, this is what I need you to understand from me. Aggressive communication can include making demands on somebody without even listening to them. Sometimes it involves shouting, sometimes it's interruptive, sometimes it's about taking over other people's spaces. Bullying is a form of aggressiveness. When we are bullied, we're a form of aggressiveness because aggressive communication doesn't respect other people's needs. It usually hurts feelings and it can damage relationships. So the assignment is how do we learn how to be assertive and you train yourself to be assertive as opposed to operating in places of aggressive. And that means sometimes you gotta take a step back. That means you have to reevaluate. That means you have to assess and you have to think about how you're gonna approach it and how you enter the dialogue. Now, that might take some time. You might need some time to do that. You might need some practice because like we said, we're training ourselves to do something different. We're training ourselves to do something different. But once you get familiar with it, once you get familiar, once you get in step with it, it becomes easier to do. And it's not necessarily about stepping back. You can do it in the moment. You can do it off the cuff, right? And, you, and people can learn to understand what it is to respect your boundaries, respect your perspectives, and to know how you feel about a particular moment without working yourself up to the point where you get angry. And here's the other thing. Here's the other thing. Once it's done, let it be done. Once it is done, let it be done. Once you have said what you needed to say, once you have been clear, and once you have established how you feel and your perspective and how you are going to move forward, let it be done. You may have to reinforce it sometimes because people will try. They'll try to cross the line again. They'll try to go over it again. But let it be done. Let the moment be done. Don't, don't hold on to that. Don't harbor that. Don't fester it. Don't let it, don't let it catch you because it can bother you. And it can and it can show up and affect you. I got a story, and I'm gonna let you. I'm gonna, I'm gonna let you go. I had um, I'm, I'm at the jail, and there's this young cat. My wife has heard this story. My friends have heard this story already. Uh, happened a couple of weeks ago. I'm at the jail, um, and I'm going. I'm going to the jail based upon my supervisor. My supervisor said this inmate has requested to be moved several different times. Um, he has not behaved in order to be moved, but he's going to get moved today. He's going to get moved. He's been doing what he needs to do. We're going to move him. I can't go see him. Go see him and tell him he's going to get moved, but this is what he has to do. These are the ramifications. These are the rules for his movement. I said, no problem. I go in, he sees me and not the supervisor and immediately starts cussing me out. And I mean, cussing me out. I mean, street cussing me out. He's going at me. He is coming at me. Mal, he is coming for me. He is coming for me big. He's coming for me. He's talking. And I'm like, yo. And I said to him, I said, man, I'm trying to help you. I'm trying to show you. I'm trying to, I'm trying to tell you. Nah, nah, nah. The supervisor, the supervisor. I said, now, and he does have a mental history and all that other kind of stuff. I said, but listen, 
I'm here to help you. She sent me. They sent me to talk to you. I don't care about that. Get out of my face. Get out. He starts talking about get out of his face, get this out of the third. And I was good with that. But then he started talking about what he's going to do to me. He started talking about what he's going to do to me. He's going to start talking about. Now he's about five foot seven. And he weighs about 130 pounds, maybe 140. I'll give him 140. Wet. And he's talking about how he's going to hurt me. He's going to talk about all this stuff he's going to do to me. He's going to talk about it. He's telling the guard who's standing there with me, open this gate. Open this gate so I can get to him. Open this gate. And I'm like, I'm trying to help you though, man. And I tried. Let me tell you, family, I tried. With everything in me, I tried to keep that thing together. He got to start talking about me, calling me punk this, call me punk that, call me all kind of names and all that kind of stuff. By the time the guard is pulling me away from his gate, I am back to Elizabeth, New Jersey. I am all the way home. I am home on the corner of Elizabeth and Catherine Street. I'm on, I'm on, I'm on the corner of William and Catherine. I am about to break him up. And I'm like, yo, and I'm doing, and I'm doing, I'm doing it all. I'm doing hood. I'm, I'm moving my hands. I'm doing it. And the guard is like, oh, okay, let's, let's, let's break this off. Right. So I step out. Right. And they move me out of there. And I just find myself, I'm in the administrator's office and I'm just kind of walking back and forth. And one of the captains said, you pacing? And I was like, yo, yo, that said, they got, I said, I said, I got got today. I said, I got got today. I'm usually good. I got got today. They was like, I got it. You know, do what you need to do. Walk around, take a breath, whatever. I went outside. I started lapping outside. I started walking in circles. I'm mumbling to myself. Think he is. Yo, yo, little cat. Think he going. I'm, I'm losing it. I'm, I'm bugging him. And so I kind of processed it down. Thought I had worked through it. Saw him the next day in my office. The supervisor brings him into my office. And everything shot back up. Right? Everything shot back up. I was like, Yo, all right, so what we gonna say to him? So what we gonna say to him? And he saw me, right? He saw me and we made eye contact and he turned away real fast um, because he knew he had messed up, right? He knew he had messed up. And so he saw me, but he turned away and and I wanted, all I wanted to do, and, I, and, I'm, and I'm asking y'all, I'm just, I'm just being transparent. All I wanted to do was jump on. All I wanted to do was jump on, right? And I'm thinking about y'all don't care about this job. I got another gig. I'm, you know, I'm this, that, and th I'm, I'm all, I'm all over the place. But I'm telling you this story because the reality is there's nothing he could do to me. There's nothing he could do to me, right? As a, as a young black man in jail, as a man who was struggling with mental health illness that didn't want to wrap his mind around it, as a man who was facing about four or five years because he's in jail, he hasn't even gone to court yet. He's facing about anywhere from five to seven years he's got to do in prison. All of the things that are happening, I'm like, yo, what could he really do to me? Right. But all because of some words that were said behind the gate. Right. I mean, he behind the gate. He can't do anything. He couldn't even do anything at the moment. But I was so worked up because that's that was the energy that he was given. Right. And that's the energy I was giving back. And so when 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 I walked by him, um, I said, I said, we are right today. And he's like, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. I said, all right. All right, so this is as long as we good. And I went over in the corner and I and I did like this for about a half hour. I just said I sat I sat on my desk and did like this for about a half hour. But I had to woosa, right? And really check because it's easy to get caught up. It's easy to get caught up and hold on to things. So I want to just, if I can minister to anybody, once it's done, let it be done. Process through it. Let it be done. Don't hold on to that stuff because that stuff can mess you up in the long run. That stuff can get to you, all right? So we hope and pray that you have understood or processed some level of understanding anger and your own anger and your own journeys. I'm sure that many of you can share experiences and stories just like that. But we, what you want to do is you want to make sure that you're clear. You want to make sure that you're addressed. You want to make sure that you are assertive and you understand that people understand where you're coming from and how you feel. But you also want to make sure that um, you are looking to build and not destroy, that you're looking to build up and not to tear down. So my prayer is, is that in this process, 
that if you need to watch this again, you need to see this again, you need to process this, that all things that you would do that. Um, uh, because people know, like I said Sunday, people know how to push our buttons sometimes. People know the buttons, right? Family members, friends, people we're connected to, spouses. They know how to, they know how to find a button, but it is our assignment to figure out how we deal with those things. Somebody said to me years ago, and I'm gonna leave you with this, I thought it was very helpful. Somebody said, you have a right to be angry. You do not have a right to be cruel. So wrestle with that. You got a right to be angry. You do not have a right to be cruel. So all of the things that you may find yourself angry about, what happened to you growing up as a kid, what happened to you in a previous relationship, what happened to you being let down with a friend. Yeah, you got a right to be angry about it all, but how you deal with it, you do not have a right to be cruel and wound other people based upon your anger. Indeed it is, easier said than done all the time, particularly in the jail, <laughs> but it is indeed Reverend Brown, easier said than done. But we hope that you are managing it and that we hope that all things you understand that grace is not just for us, but grace is for everyone. That grace is not just for us. That we say, oh man, I lost it today. I went off on somebody, but God forgives me because I, I'm, I'm under grace. Everybody's under grace. And that, that, that perspective, and if everybody's under grace, then let's look to build and construct. So we hope and pray this was helpful. Um, we hope it um, has been insightful on some level. We hope that you've been um, at the very least engaged a little bit and it's caused some thought provoking moments. Um, next week, next week, we are going to talk about the limp of insecurity. Oh my God. Talk about the limp of insecurity. What does it mean to be insecure? Um, and so uh, buckle up. <laughs> That's all I can tell you. Buckle up. We're going to talk about what it is to be insecure and how our insecurities manifest themselves and show themselves in the places of our lives. All right. So tonight we want to just thank everybody for sharing. Thank you all for coming out. Uh, Facebook Live people, um, big up to y'all. Thank you for all my Zoom partners. We're grateful for all of you. New Calvary family, continue to pray as we go on this journey. We are looking uh, in this season of planning. We are planning uh, for 2022. So it's gonna be a whole lot of conversation about what 22 looks like um, and how we as a church come together uh, to really reorganize and restructure New Calvary uh, in this season as we look forward to going to do ministry as we move forward. So be ready uh, for those conversations and those dialogues, but we are excited about it. Come and fellowship with us and worship at 10 a.m. Come on and worship with us, 10 a.m. You can come live. Please make sure that you register. Uh, call the church and register for that. Or you can go on virtual Facebook and YouTube. And so we are grateful for all of you who continue to remain faithful in your giving and in your sharing and in your worship experience with all of us. We are grateful for you. Please make sure that you continue to share uh, your gifts to the New Calvary Church as we continue to do this ministry. Pray for me. I am traveling. Um, my mother is, um, um, I'm helping my mother move. Uh, and uh, we drew straws and we a politic to see where she was going to move. And uh, she's going to move with my middle brother, our middle brother in West Palm Beach, closer to West Palm Beach, Florida. I could not convince her. She said it was too cold in Virginia because she's used to Florida now. So she's going to just stay in Florida and move closer to my brother. Um, but we are going to move her this uh, weekend. So pray for me uh, as we do that. Uh, and as I travel and I fly down there uh, to be bossed around by my mother. Um, <laughs> um, so. Uh, if there are any prayers or concerns, uh, continue to lift them up in this moment. We pray for all of you. In fact, let us pray in this moment as we call on the name of the Lord. God, we thank you. We thank you for sharing with us today. We're grateful for how you continue to bless us and watch over us, Lord. In all things, we are grateful for your hand that this continues to reveal to us that you are in control. And God, in those places where we don't feel like we are in control, we ask that you would give us a Selah moment, a moment of pause, a moment of deep breath, a moment where we can take a break and we can reflect. Help us, God, to assert our feelings as opposed to being aggressive. Help us to build up instead of tearing down. 
And in all things, we give you praise. We are grateful for study. We're grateful for learning. We're grateful for your word and continue, God, to just show us what it is we need to do, where to step and how to deal uh, with the people in our lives. We even struggle in our limps, but even in our limps, we give you glory. So watch over us until we fellowship with each other again. And in all things, we say thank you. It is in the wonderful, marvelous, and majestic name of Jesus, the people of God together say amen, amen, and amen. Our hearing impaired brothers and sisters say amen, amen and praise God. Amen. 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 Thank you all. Y'all have a good evening. Big Mal, what's up, Big?